everybody, welcome back to Exponential Finance, the podcast covering finance, technology and innovation, from our home in Japan and beyond. Maria Guajardo's passion is to do the greatest good for those with the greatest need, and to develop the next generation of global leaders. She served as Vice President at Soka University, Tokyo, Japan, as the inaugural Dean of the Faculty of International Liberal Arts, and is recipient of the Soka University Award of Highest Honor. Soka University is one of 11 private universities with the distinction of being named a super global university by the Japanese Ministry of Education. Maria served as a national speaker and trainer with a focus on educational equity, leadership, and inclusive excellence. Previously, as the executive director of the Mayor's Office for Education and Children in Denver, Colorado, she championed educational access. A licensed child psychologist, in 2005 she received a congressional commendation for her contributions to Latino education. In 2008 she co-chaired the Democratic National Convention Committee's Education Initiative, and launched Denver's Youth Agenda. Maria was inducted into the prestigious Colorado Women's Hall of Fame in 2010. In 2016, the University of Denver conferred the AHSS Lifetime Achievement Award to Maria. Her community service includes the Children's Hospital Colorado Board, the Denver Foundation Board and she served as a University of Denver trustee for 20 years. She continues as a trustee at Soka University of America. Maria was a Kellogg National Fellow, KNFP 11, and co-chaired the Kellogg Fellows Leadership Alliance Board. And now, please welcome Maria Guajardo, professor at Soka University. Hello Maria, Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Norbert. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you very much for taking the time. This is our first recording in 2021. Very exciting. Excellent. A little unusual topic maybe for a fintech or finance podcast. We want to talk about higher education today. And while you are a professor at Soka University now, you spend quite a substantial amount of time in what I would call the politics of education and in, as an administrator and as a trustee. So... My first question is, where does this passion for education come from? And how did you channel that into the different activities that you did prior to going to Soka? That's a great question. And I often share that my career path was circular and very convoluted and not linear as it might be for others. My parents were immigrants to the United States, and as peasant farmers, neither one of them learned how to read or write. They were both illiterate. However, they valued the educational experience highly. As a young child, I wanted to become a teacher because I had had fabulous teachers in elementary school, and I wanted to be able to give that gift back. And over time, I realized that there were other levels of engagement and impact while education is absolutely near and dear to my heart and at the core of who I am, realizing and recognizing that education was a pathway that opened up many opportunities for me. My early beginnings became a passion for wanting to create access for others that might be first generation college goers or might be low income or might be in the minority or a refugee group. How do we create access? Because for many, education is an opportunity is an opportunity builder leading into the future. Among your family, do you have brothers and sisters? I have five siblings and all of us completed high school. All of us went to college. There are a collection of, I don't know, several master's degrees, a law degree, a PhD. So all of us attained some level of higher ed. That's amazing. I can only imagine what it might mean if you're a first-generation immigrant and farm labor. Your parents must be tremendously proud of what they accomplished in bringing up six kids. Well, you know, I think that everything is relative. And for them, their goal was that we not be laborers. Their goal was that if we were educated, we would have what they called a good job. That meant an office job. There was little distinction about what did it mean to get an advanced degree. It was just pretty basic, you know, don't work as hard as we had to out in the field. I would also say that with time, the access problem continues because of the increase in tuition rates at universities. And so I don't know that this problem has escaped us quite yet, and we certainly haven't solved it. But the cost of higher education and whether it's good return on investment I think persists as a question for many parents 
and many students interested in pursuing university degree. Is it fair when we look at this from a global perspective to talk a bit about the crisis of higher education because of this high cost? Because especially over the last year, it has become apparent for many parents, but also students, I think, that if you pay $50,000 in tuition, for example, for the better schools, or maybe even some average ones, and you end up with video classes, is that value for money? And the student debt that comes with it that needs to be paid off. It's a significant investment and a barrier at the same time. So how do you see that developing? Will the pandemic be a catalyst in a way for changes? I think it's an opportunity to begin to delve deeper into what is the purpose of higher education for, I would suggest to you for decades and perhaps even centuries, the purpose of higher education was really an opportunity to continue to maintain a status. It was those that were elite that had the opportunity to become educated, and it served as a differentiator between the haves and the have-nots. And I think because of the pandemic, that has been exposed once again. Because of the exposure of certain conflicts of interest, legacy, where parents that were wealthier were able to buy their students' admission into some of the Ivy League schools in the United States, this became an issue. And it was that exposure that I think began to raise the question, what kind of an investment is it today? And I think with the advent of technology, of just progress globally, students are finding that they may not need that structured four-year experience in order to be able to get a foot into the door as an entrepreneur or for a startup company. And so I think now, I wouldn't call it a crisis, but I think it's an open debate. I think it's a debate now as to whether or not the value of investing four years and that financial commitment is in fact achieving the goal that many young minds want to achieve today. So I don't see it as black and white. I don't think it's, well, you either go to a four year and pay $50,000 in tuition or you don't. I think universities are going to get smarter coming out of the pandemic and more creative about how they cater to working professionals, to working young adults to a field, a sector now where because of technology and because of the rapid progress of change, universities will have to keep up and that's going to change the game. Of course, in every crisis comes with an opportunity and you can look at the bright side as you're doing. Traditionally, we think about higher education in these big chunks, whether it's the bachelor first and then the master a bit later or even a PhD on top. For a long time, we've talked about this continuous education, maybe smaller bite-sized chunks, but every year rather than at certain points in your life. And in this continuous education opportunity serving more to the real-time needs, that is really an opportunity for the universities as well to reposition themselves. That's correct. And I think then countries differ in terms of how they approach higher education, the value that they have, the access opportunity that they have for promoting it. And so that begs the question, well, will there be consistency across countries? Will there be differences? And what really matters? What should we keep our eye on as this evolution emerges and then continues? If you look at technology today, in many sectors, it's a winner-takes-all game. If you think theoretically about a Harvard University, for example, they're making their education available through digital channels to a wide population, which technically wouldn't be a problem. It's a challenge from a proposition perspective because it's very much, as you said earlier, the inclusion versus exclusion type of thing. Even today, Harvard would be able to double the class size if they wanted to for their physical classes, but they don't do it because they want to keep it scarce. But if they were to open it up into a digital channel, where does this leave, let's say, the second tier schools? Because then everybody with an attractive price point would take a Harvard school rather than a school that doesn't really have a recognized name. 
Mm, that's a great question. And actually, I think we can learn a bit about what happened in 2020 in the United States in terms of higher education. While we anticipated that enrollment would drop because students were facing economic challenges because of the pandemic, because of the switch to emergency online teaching, in the fall, what we found was that universities who committed to face-to-face -face teaching actually saw an increase in enrollment. And so one can then assume from that that students are seeking that face-to-face -face encounter. Students are seeking the community, the physical community. And at, think about the age group. Between the ages of 18 and 22, 23, you are in a developmental phase of life where you are learning who you are, what matters to you, how to develop and be in relationship with others. If life is just on Zoom, we will have to find new ways to navigate that development. So I believe that universities that offered the face-to-face -face experience of teaching saw a greater increase because students are seeking that connection, seeking that sense of community. So again, I don't think it's black or white. I think we're really going to have to think anew about how do we support this very important phase of development of young people, because it differs. You know, a 50-year-old going back to get a master's degree is in a different position than an 18-year-old who is seeking to become independent, wanting to step out on their own, wanting to find a long-lasting relationship, right? That's a very different context. So I think we have to be able to become a bit more specific about the purpose of higher education depending on the demographic. It's a very good point and I'm the 50 year old so nowadays maybe not so much for my generation yet but you would expect to have another 30 40 years to live while well, before it might have been unthinkable to go back to school in your 50s if you have 30 more years to live and maybe a large part of that also to work possibly then why wouldn't you in some shape or form take some formal education and I think that's why we saw such a massive race to online MOOC classes. They were either at no cost or low cost. Thousands of individuals took advantage of these online classes, some of them for certificates. Many, though, thousands took it just for that sense of enhancement and self-development. So I think we're wading into new waters here. And I think the pandemic forced us to raise these questions that we can't just assume if you pay more to an Ivy League school like Harvard or Yale or Stanford, if you pay more, somehow you're getting a better education. I think that assumption is being challenged left and right now. It almost becomes an insurance policy because of the brand recognition that you say, I will get a minimum type of job if I go to this school, but I also need to pay $50,000 a year. On the other hand, though, from the employer side, would also need to see some change, right? You need to become more accepting of these certificates, professional skills, really like the skill-based education. If I can demonstrate that I've taken a number of certificates over the last four years, then I can prove that I have certain education, and that's then equivalent to some sort of formal university degree. And the flexibility from the employer side hasn't necessarily been there yet either. That's correct. However, I would go back to raising the question of the specificities within countries. So in Japan, for example, an advanced degree does not necessarily gain you an advanced position. In Japan, higher education, there is not a push to go on to graduate school because employers aren't expecting it. Employers, and this is a generalization, however, I think it's fairly accurate, are looking for young college graduates who are flexible, moldable, and willing to learn the corporate culture. So they want someone who is less fixed in their way, someone who's going to start at an entry level and be groomed into the culture of that organization. Having a master's degree doesn't really gain you that much in certain sectors. So you're at a disadvantage in some way. So it's really curious as to, yes, we want higher level, better skilled, more competent workforce, and yet some systems aren't promoting that. Compared to 30 years ago, how do you think this has developed essentially from a corporate perspective here in Japan? Are they as successful with it as they were 30 years ago? 
While not a historical expert on Japanese higher ed, my firsthand experience of Japanese undergraduates today at my university, for example, which is comparable to many universities, the big push is in their third year to meet prospective employers and to get a firm job offer so that 12 months later, they will have a job to walk into. So think about that. Think in my particular faculty, over 95% of our students have secured an employment contract before graduation. So students are getting hired at a rapid pace. And yes, the pandemic has thrown that a bit off kilter. However, if you suggest about the last 30 years, the evaluation of Japanese universities, one variable is the percentage of students that have that employment commitment upon graduation. So universities are ranked on this prospect. Think about that. So there's going to be an inordinate amount of investment in terms of wanting to get students connected to employers. So has there been a change over the last 30 years? That system continues. That system continues. So what is changing? And I think, I, again, I think it's nuanced by the sector. Perhaps in the tech sector, they're looking for not that entry-level employee, but someone with that certification with the knowledge base to be able to come in, ramp up and step into that space. So I think we have to continue for as much as we don't like it, we have to not stick to these generalizations, but begin to inquire what is happening by sector. So continuing with the Japan scene, you came here as part of an effort to internationalize the higher education, which has been going on now for also the better part of a decade, I think. How has that been going? And again, probably a nuanced view, but what works, what hasn't worked so much? So the Ministry of Education, MEXT, here in Japan, for the last, I would say, two decades, certainly, have been prioritizing the attraction of international students and the study abroad of Japanese domestic students. And why? So I think it's important to consider the demographics here. Japan does not have a replicable birth rate. So that means we are not reproducing in order to sustain the population. And 30% of our population currently is over the age of 65. So we have an aging population. We have a diminishing college entry student population. So we need human resources, not only to populate our universities, but also to be able to contribute to the workforce. So human resources to go into the labor market. Towards that end, globalization became a priority. So there have been a number of education campaigns through, offered through the Ministry of Education, Go Global, the top global university campaign now. I call them campaigns only because it feels like it's a marketing campaign at times that has come forward to try to augment the number of international students coming into Japan to study and to increase the number of Japanese students going out to foreign countries for higher education. The incoming part seems obvious to me, and it might just be a perception thing, but you clearly see many young from the Asian region, but also beyond coming here to study Korean, Chinese, Taiwanese, Indonesians, and so on. I was looking at numbers of Japanese going abroad, especially I think for the US, those are tracked and published. These numbers have been declining, which, as you said, needs to be put into the context of a declining population and a lower birth rate. So it would naturally be fewer people than a decade ago or so. But do you see equal success on the inbound and outbound side? What's been a challenge to navigate within universities is if the goal is to, for example, bring in more international students, that begs the question, then what are you doing at your university to prepare and to be able to maintain the level of educational quality for those international students? What has happened on occasion is that Japanese professors who speak English are being asked to teach in English with little or no preparation. So it's like asking you, Norbert, well, because you know this side of finance and tech and you're multilingual, can't you just step into another country and do the same thing? I mean, you know the language, right? It's not that simple. We understand that. However, unfortunately, in universities here in Japan, that's what's happened. 
So there's been a burden on faculty to take on this additional work. As students go out, Japanese students go out into the world and come back, I had one colleague say to a group of Japanese students who are about to embark on study abroad, you can go out and learn, but don't bring those values back. Don't bring that mentality back. I mean, if I hadn't been sitting in the room, I would have really questioned whether someone had said that. But sitting in the room and listening to this statement being shared to students, go out and learn, but then don't change too much. And what we have found is that when our Japanese students return from study abroad, they're in a quagmire because they've been exposed to new values, new systems, new ways of being. And to question that has not typically been supported within the Japanese society. There's this tension that we need to balance as Japan tries to go global. There's this tension between, I want you to change, but then don't change. And that is a challenge for all of us. Although we talk about higher education here, this similar marketing campaign of a global financial city, Tokyo, happens in the finance world as well, similar to the education world. And it does seem like lots of marketing simply because the underlying values, as you described, if you want to become an international center for anything, you also need to be accepting of diversity to a certain extent. In this transition as a country to want to be able to be competitive in various sectors, whether it's finance or education, uh, health, there is going to be this necessary tension that needs to be managed. And I think the Olympics are a great example of this. So in 1964, Tokyo hosted the Olympics, and it was almost a coming out, a reintroduction of Japan to the world as a international entity. Well, the 2020 Olympics were posed to capture that same spirit. We're recovering from the triple disaster. We are on the cutting edge of technology, of dealing with the elderly, the health area. So all of this was going to be seen as a rebranding, repitching of the stellar position Japan is in. And yet because of the pandemic, that's been pushed back. And so it, it again begs the question, how can we prepare to be that global partner? And what does that mean we have to be doing with that 18-year-old who's seeking his next life step, right? How do we keep that in balance with this desire to remain with a cultural old at times? and yet want to invite in the new of the technology. I mean, it's just this amazing tension that we're in the middle of. It's obviously a very homogeneous population, although, what are the numbers? Two and a half million foreigners in Japan on 125 million population. So it's also not totally insignificant, but it's still very much a minority on the fringes and it needs to become a little more mainstream to have an impact on the working culture. And I think that that change is slow in coming. For my international students, I just met with a student from Ghana, one from Nigeria, and they both said, you know, we clearly are seen as other as foreign, as alien. And I think as long as these young minds come to the country and then feel so ostracized, I mean, it's the basic elements of just humanity. If no one sits next to you on the bus or on the train, I mean, at some point you begin to question how inclusive might this society be for me, for my prospective family, for future children. Yeah, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Take the comparison to the prior Olympics, where there wasn't much competition in Asia. If you just look at the continent by itself, a good friend always says the Asian Development Bank is based in Manila, and that was created in 1965, so around the time of the Olympics. And the reason it's there was that at the time, Manila was considered the up-and-coming center in Asia. And now we've got so many different options. China is strong, Singapore, Hong Kong, Indonesia is coming up, Malaysia is there, Thailand is coming. 
for those people who are kind of looking for a new home or looking for a challenge outside of their own country and want to be in Asia, it's not like Tokyo is the only location they could consider. So the competitive balance has completely changed over that period of time. One topic that we haven't touched on that I just want to interject here quickly, and that's the gender gap. It is projected by the World Economic Forum that Japan will achieve gender equity in over 250 years from today. 250 years. And I think that that is also an indicator of how a country is deemed competitive and progressive on the world stage. Yeah, there's some catching up to do in certain areas. And as you suggest, it's not a done deal because we're seeing development and progress and innovation in many of our surrounding countries, many surrounding countries to Japan. It's also a super interesting point. I've been, as a former employee, following Kathy Mitsui's work at Goldman on the Formonomics, which had a 20-year anniversary in 2019. There's a whole career of work that went into that. The absolute numbers are, let's say, okay, because actually the female participation in pure numbers is relatively high, but the quality of the jobs and then the progression into the senior management roles, which obviously should be part of it, is completely lacking. Correct. And I often use the example of who works at McDonald's. In the United States, it's the high school student. It's the young college student. It's a part-time job after school for some extra spending money. That's the United States. Who works at McDonald's in Japan? Here in Tokyo, it's often the middle-aged woman who probably has a college degree, but went out of the job market because of her family, to raise her family, support her husband. And now that the children are grown and don't need as much childcare, she can now return to work. And now she is the one who is employed at the 7-Eleven, at the McDonald's, part-time. And there are financial disincentives. There are policy disincentives in Japan for a two-person working household, right? So it's at a disadvantage. I've had colleagues say, well, we're going to get taxed if my wife works. So might as well just have her not work. So I think when your system is a disincentive, and Matsui has shared this as one of the barriers and challenges. When you have policies that very clearly are in disincentive for women to return to work, we're going to have to be catching up. We're not going to be in the same place. So yes, although the numbers are there, the positions. Yeah. Who do you want having to work at McDonald's? It's surprising that what we would consider maybe low-hanging fruits, because these are very obvious levers, both on the female participation side, but also as far as the international workforce is concerned. The chambers of commerce have been very vocal over the last year with the inheritance tax, with how foreigners have been treated on returning during the pandemic and and all of these. These are very obvious levers. If you switch them in the right direction, they would affect true change. The change doesn't happen at the core. The, The change happens at this marketing level of saying we want to be international. These two things have not been connected somehow. That's right. That's right. And again, I think it's that paradox. So to go back to my position at the university, I was the first female dean and the first non-Japanese to serve in a leadership role. And I often say that there was this great desire for Soka University to want to go global and hence the desire to bring in a foreigner. And at the same time, there's nothing easy about change. There's nothing easy about change. And so that reflects, I think, the condition of the country. Yes, we want to change, but don't ask me to do anything different, right? Can I keep doing what I'm doing now? And I don't want to sound completely pessimistic. I do see inroads being made. And I do see these young minds coming into the workforce, bright and questioning and curious. And that holds a lot of promise for the future. So I'm not pessimistic. But I'm also wanting to speak the truth to some of the disparities that exist. Absolutely. And we've seen great changes made by, for me, surprisingly, I I must admit, companies like Sompo, who last year abolished the year-by-year promotion system up to like middle management or so up to 39 years old. So that actually young people entering the workforce now get promoted on merit rather than based on time. And in effect, if they are superstars, it could reach that 
that position that previously they would achieve with 39, they would achieve now in their late 20s. And that's a massive change for Japan by one of the traditional companies, one of the top three insurers. Insurance and Japan, it can't be more conservative than that. And they make this change. That was significant, I thought. So I think that's a great example that change is coming change is coming. And I think the bigger question is, what can we do to accelerate it? What can we do to accelerate it in a way that's mindful, in a way that is humanistic, in a way that will both respect the context, the country that we're in, and yet allow for change and transformation. So to me, this is a time of renaissance. And if we think of it that way, there's great possibility. Now, change ideally comes from multiple sides. Your personal situation and the bold step that Soka has taken with bringing in you as a foreigner and female and as a dean is a bold step in driving this from the top. That's very rare, I think. There needs to be some bottom-up change to complement this and then throughout the organization. The question is always where you start. Doing this from the top has a very strong signal for the whole organization reflecting on when you came in and how that has changed now over the seven years or so that you've been been here, how would you describe the change that has gone through the organization and the pace of change over that time? I would say that actually it's been a change in my own perspective. Well, initially coming in, I believe that there were great opportunities for change and transformation top down. Meeting the students that I've met as a professor in the field of leadership studies, my life mission is to raise that next generation of global leaders. And so today, I would say to you that my biggest learning in seven years is how much change is possible from the bottom up. And now when students come to me to either complain or provide a new idea or say, why can't we do this? I'll say, then do it. I will support you from behind the scenes, but my job is to get out of your way. My job is not to be a gatekeeper and to somehow filter and judge the quality of change and transformation that is being suggested by students. My job is to get out of the way, out of their way, so that they can move forward. And my job is not to let them fail, not to purposely, well, I'll just stand on the sidelines, but to really be able to walk alongside them. So I would say in seven years, the biggest change has been my own perspective. Where is change possible? And and that's why I speak about the need for leadership and social change. And that leadership is not position and title. That leadership is a perspective where one owns one's own agency to be able to contribute to the greater good. Thank you very much, Maria. That was a great conversation. Really enjoyed this for a wonderful start to 2021, which hopefully will turn out to be a much better year and then can take all this positive energy and help affect change wherever it's needed. Great. And all the best to you this year. And again, thank you so much for the invite and may your family, extended family, nuclear family, may they all be safe. Thank you very much. Same to you. All right. Bye-bye.